Hi, CJ. Hello. <coughs> Although I should wave this way. Hi, BJ. Mm, yes, I can hear you. Okay, I think uh, we can go ahead and get started. Good morning to all the people in Bulgaria in person and good afternoon, good evening, whatever, depending on the time zone, wherever you are. So welcome to the session of uh, Biodiversity Informatics Perspectives from Asia and the Global South. Uh, the, we have uh, four presentations, so we'll go through the presentations. Uh, we'll take any uh, quick questions immediately after the presentations, and at the end, we'll have some time for uh, discussion. Uh, uh, Prabhakar and Balu have been uh, really helpful in putting this all together, and they will definitely uh, join us in the uh, discussion towards uh, towards the end. So. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and get started. The first presentation is a recorded one by uh, Daphne about the Taiwan Biodiversity Information Facility. So we can uh, maybe play, play that. Daphne is also online, and so it would be nice if she can put on her okay, video. And if not to everyone anywhere in the world. I'm Daphne Ho, presenting in this symposium session to share about what we are doing in Taiwan Biodiversity Information Facility, in short, TAIBIF, particularly with our work in facilitating open biodiversity data in Taiwan. Let me give a brief introduction about TAIBIF. We are based in Taipei, Taiwan, under Biodiversity Research Center Academia Sinica. TAIBIF was established in 2001 
as one of the first global biodiversity information facility, GBIF's notes. We are a relatively small team consisting of developers, data administrators, content and product managers, and researchers who together work with a purpose to promote open biodiversity data. TIBIF has five missions. We develop infrastructures for biodiversity-related data. We promote the open data concept. We facilitate the publication and integration of biodiversity information. We support biodiversity-related research and policy making and to connect Taiwan and international biodiversity information. We have various tasks undergoing to achieve each of the miss missions mentioned here. And in this presentation, I will share with all of you some of what we have done, what we have been doing, and what our future task will be. The first mission is to develop infrastructures for biodiversity-related data. Thanks to our developers, we have a data portal mainly provide biodiversity open data searching and downloading. Most importantly, Documents and teaching materials related to open data concept and publishing can be found in our site. In the near future, we would like to include interactive visualization of data in this site for a better user experience. Additionally, as the only GBIF data hosting center currently available in Asia, TIBIF offers services such as a regularly maintained integrated publishing toolkit or IPT, a tool using ecological metadata language and Darwin Core as data standards to assist data providers in publishing their data to TIBIF and GBIF. Here, I would also like to make a shout out to my teammate, Melissa Liu, being a very helpful and responsive help desk for supporting users throughout data set and data paper publishing process. We also developed a scientific name checking tool called the Norman Match, which allows users to check if their scientific name is accurate based on various global and national taxonomical checklists. For the past 20 years, TIBIF has maintained and frequently updating Taiwan Catalog of Life. This checklist is important as it represents the most important backbone reference for all major biodiversity data holders in Taiwan. As of current, Taiko has recorded more than 64,000 species. We also developed a desktop program for the management of camera trap data to support the use in field stations without a stable internet connection. To promote open data concept, TIBIF organizes data mobilization and data use workshops every year. The workshop covers a few of the most important topics about data mobilization, that is data standards, cleaning, and publishing. In recent years, we included also training on how to publish a data paper and how to perform research data management. Furthermore, this workshop also covers topics regarding data licensing. We are in the process of developing training materials for anyone who is not able to attend the workshop but wishes to learn more about data mobilization. Within the community, we invite people in different fields to share their research or work related to ecological informatics. Since 2021, we have organized four mini symposiums and this community is actively growing and popular science articles were published in different journals or magazines within the country. Our next mission is to facilitate the publication and integration of biodiversity information. As of September 24th, TIBIF has opened more than 13 million occurrence records and 86 data sets to GBIF, making it the second largest data contributor in Asia. Most of these data were from 19 data publishers, which whom we keep close contact with. We encourage also the publication of data papers, so we provide advice, technical and financial support for any data publisher who wish to publish data paper. 
Perhaps one of the most rewarding things from these missions is to see if this data can be put to good use. We are happy to see that open biodiversity data in Thai beef has supported studies across different fields. Since 2016, 39 peer-reviewed studies using data in Thai beef have been published. Other than research, the data also supports Taiwan Biodiversity Observation Network, and this helps to facilitate mainstreaming biodiversity concerns into policy making. To connect Taiwan and international biodiversity information, Thai Beef's current active tasks include allying with Taiwan Biodiversity Information Alliance, a national biodiversity network aimed at the integration of local biodiversity data from various governmental agencies and museums. Thai Beef has maintained close interactions and cooperation with GBIF, regularly assisting in the Biodiversity Information Fund for Asia or BIFA projects, regional workshops, and communications between members of Asian countries. Lastly, some of the future work we want to do as part of the goal to facilitate open biodiversity data in Taiwan is that we are currently developing a volunteer training system to cultivate new talents within the community. And so far, we have a few people interested and in sign up for this. We group these volunteers into three major types. The open data ambassador, who will become a mentor during any of our data mobilization workshop. Considering most researchers we know in the country are interested with making their data open, but just do not have time to clean their data, we also train data cleaner volunteer. So data publishers can reach out to us and we can connect them with our volunteer to assist with the cleaning work before publishing. Lastly, the translator. Since most of the training materials or the latest news in biodiversity informatics are in English, we need someone to translate these materials to Mandarin so it will be easier for the Mandarin-speaking community to follow and catch up with the news. Depending on the task and our budget, these volunteers can be paid. Next, our team would like to investigate biodiversity data gaps in Taiwan and determine goals to fill these gaps. We also encourage data publishers to publish their biodiversity data of various types. This includes DNA, photos, videos, and also soundscape data. By this, I will start translating GBIF's data, uh, DNA data publishing guide into Chinese. We want to thank previous and current Thai Beef members, our close partners from Taiwan Biodiversity Network, our funding agencies, Taiwan National Science and Technology Council, and Taiwan Forestry Bureau. If you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you. Uh, there seems to be a question uh, from Carlos, and he says it can be replied later to uh, who uh, who compiles and maintains the uh, Maria Poda the for uh, Thai beef. I mean, you hi. Know. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. So these are uh, answers for Carlos' questions. Uh, questions regarding to uh, maintaining checklist, species checklist of uh, any kind of species in Taiwan. Uh, we have a data manager uh, who is working fully on this. And uh, I can refer her to you later because she knows the expert better than me. Mm. I, I can pass you the uh, her contact maybe later in Slack if that's all right for you. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what uh, Carlos has uh, said. So he wants to get in touch. Uh, so a kind of follow-up question. Uh, oh, Prabhakar has a question. Prabhakar, please go ahead. 
you're on, you, mute. You are on mute. Yeah, that was a very nice talk. Uh, good to know that Taiwan has done quite a lot of work for the last 20 years on biodiversity informatics. Uh, I had seen it much earlier as well. Um, uh, I have a couple of a couple of questions. One is, uh, uh, what are the major challenges that you that you people are now facing in Taiwan? What is the kind of uh, challenge to mobilizing data? What are the immediate uh, hurdles that you see to mobilizing data? Or are all the research institutions all networked in mobilizing data? The second thing is uh, language. You did mention about uh, language support and things like that. How do you manage this uh, language differentiation between Chinese, which is the, uh, the language of science in Taiwan as well, and the international language on biodiversity informatics? Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, I will answer the first uh, question first. Regarding uh, reaching out to anyone who wish to open data and major challenges, uh, I would say so far what our office think is uh, we realize actually most researchers are willing to uh, publish their data. It's just that uh, they do not have time to either digitize it or clean it. And this, uh, I, I can see this is probably uh, the most challenging thing we are having right now and also in other parts uh, of the world. Um, that's why we are developing the volunteer system and see if anyone who are interested in cleaning data so they can help each other out for this. Mm. And what, what's the second question again? Oh, language. Okay. Um, language. We, I do see that uh, for the community in Taiwan to read uh, most of this uh, maybe guidelines, documents in English is usually difficult for them. That's why uh, so far our workshops are still in Mandarin. So before we, we prepare materials, teaching materials and notes uh, on uh, for this workshop or for our website, we still need uh, maybe manpower to translate it first. Um, so far, because we have a lot available material and guides, we can get it on the internet right now. Just uh, this is also like relate to the first question. Another challenge we are having is we don't we don't have enough main power to translate it at the moment. And so we chose which material will be the will be our priority. Then we will translate the material first. Mm. Thank you for your questions. Thank you so much. So let's move on to the next presentation. Uh, which is in person. So over to the Shakespeare Hall, William. Thank you. Morning, everyone. My name is Willem Kutzer. I'm from a small town in the Eastern Cape of South Africa called Makanda. I guess some of you are aware that uh, place names in South Africa have recently, many place names have changed. So you might know it as Grahamstown. And uh, this is somewhat of a hotbed of biodiversity research, what with two natural history museums and a university. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about what we do, um, I'd, I'd love to talk to you about that. I've been quite fortunate enough, fortunate to be involved in the migration of various data sets from various museums in South Africa um, using specify software, migrating to specify software. And uh, it was uh, quite a happy coincidence that I, I got talking to Francois Becker of the National Museum of Namibia, and he expressed an interest in working with me to do the same with his collections or their collections at the museum. And I thought this might be a good opportunity to uh, stand back a bit and look at the, the process of migrating a database to specify software, which I haven't done before. 
perhaps just to get an idea of what the various challenges are at the various steps of the migration process and, and adoption progress process to um, reflect on any lessons that we might have learned and obviously to get some feedback from, from the community. So I'll just give you a brief overview of the specimen collections held by the museum and look at past digitization efforts. These have not been comprehensive or thorough, but there has been some work. And then in terms of the new database development, there are aspects that presented a challenge and, and those are the ones that I found. And then I'll just say a few words about training. I've been involved again in a lot of training initiatives and so um, there are certain things that crop up every time I introduce specify software to, to new users. Uh, this is just a, an overview that Francois put together of how he would design the specify database. So the green blocks are what we call disciplines in specify. And then the blue ones are collections that are nested within those disciplines. So you can see there's quite a diversity of, of collections at the National Museum of Namibia. And Francois being a herpetologist would obviously like to see his own collection database prioritized in the migration process. So he has thousands of images and he's keen to um, include all his genomic samples, tissue samples and DNA extractions in the specified database as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later because that is obviously one of the design considerations as to how best to represent images and genomic samples in a specified database. As I said, the past digitization efforts um, have not been thorough and for reasons that uh, I won't go into, but Francois can probably tell you more about that in future. Um, for the last 20 years or so, not much has happened at the National Museum of Namibia in terms of uh, digitizing or improving data quality. But now, uh, Francois has been appointed in, in this new position, and this is why we decided to title the talk uh, Revolutionizing Collection Management, because we really aim to completely revolutionize and uh, hopefully within a very short period of time, possibly one or two years, complete this whole process and uh, be up and running in Specify. There were a few collections that were digitized in FileMaker Pro. And one of these was the Arachnid collection, which also benefited from a very thorough and comprehensive re-examination in 2014 and migration to specify. So in fact, there was at least one collection already in specify and there was already a specified database. So perhaps this made the process a little bit easier in that we already had something to migrate data into. Other collections were captured into Excel spreadsheets directly from the catalog books. And obviously there is a lot of, uh, heterogeneity and there are a lot of data quality issues in those spreadsheets. And then one interesting collection was the entomology collection, which was um, the, the digitization of which was designed as a school project where school pupils were told to capture the, the labels. And unfortunately, uh, this didn't end well because apparently the information was actually lost. So, um, So there's not a great diversity of different uh, legacy software applications from which to migrate. And uh, I think Francois will have his work cut out for him. He's going to be the main person responsible for data cleaning. And uh, obviously I just serve in an advisory capacity. Francois will be, be doing most of the work, in fact, migrating all the data as well. Getting on to the new database development, we had to choose a platform whether we were going to use Specify 6 or Specify 7. Specify 7 is a web application. 
And considering that the Specify Collections Consortium is actually wanting to phase out Specify 6, we thought it prudent to, to continue with Specify 7, but we had some difficulty in that the National Museum of Namibia had already set up a Synology server. Now, I'm not really, a, I'm not a technical person by any stretch of the imagination, but um, we found this to be completely impossible to use. <laughs> a long story short, we, we couldn't access the file system in any way, shape or form. So if anyone knows how to do that, I'd, I'd really love to hear from you. Uh, so what we think we'll do is actually use Specify 7 in an offline mode, so to speak, where obviously it's not exposed on, on the web. Uh, the database setup and configuration, there were one or two um, things to sort out there. As I say, there was already an existing Specify database, so all we really had to do was add new collections, new, new disciplines and new collections, and this is a fairly easy process, which I was able to explain to, to Francois quite quickly. Uh, getting onto something slightly more interesting from my perspective, um, and I'll see I'm being hurried along. The, the database design, uh, there were two considerations here, whether we were going to use a, what they call in specified parlance, a nested, um, oh, sorry, um, a linked collecting event form or an embedded collecting event form. Perhaps some of you will be aware that this is if if you have a collection object that has um, that that gets a new collecting event created every time you create a new collection object. This is embedded in the collection object, or if you have many collection objects sharing a single collecting event, which gets searched for, looked up, and reused every time. This is important from a user perspective because many users will not have been exposed to this kind of uh, database logic before, and some actually struggle with it. Um, I'll just skip the data cleaning for now and just show you a form, a typical user form in Specify 7, just to show you if you can cast your eye down about a third of the way down, you'll see the voucher of, and this is relevant to whether we represent a genomic sample as a linked collection object in a different dedicated genomic collection of its own, and we, we reflect that link as, as you can see, as a collection object relationship. Or in fact, if we create a new preparation in the existing collection object representing the voucher specimen, which you can see if you look at the preparation, there are two preparations, and you can imagine the other one is the preserved specimen or skin or voucher specimen, and this tissue sample is just another preparation in, this, in the same collection object. Again, this is very important from a user perspective, especially with uh, people who haven't used a relational database or specified before. And uh, so we have to continuously balance the database design requirements against what the users expect and what the users will be comfortable using. Um, yeah, over here, I was just wanting to capture that training proceeded from a very general sort of lecture where I got up and spoke about um, fairly mundane data quality issues. And then we moved into a hands on practical where everyone got to use the software themselves. And uh, finally, we, we set up a test database where people can continue to capture records into this test database until we and they are happy that they're proficient and they can make the transition to a production database. Just some photos so that you can see the people at the museum. This is Francois and uh, some of the new curators that have been appointed in the last few years. Very excited people, very happy to be developing their museum. Thank you. Then I just want to acknowledge the National Museum of Namibia and the Specify Collections Consortium in Kansas for all the help that they've given me over the last 15 years or so, without which I certainly wouldn't be in a position to help other museums. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, William. It was really interesting to know all the developments of the Namibian National Museum.
Uh, I don't see any questions in uh, in chat or in Slack. So are there any questions in the audience there? Any questions is from any of you? Nope, I don't see any hands, VJ. Okay, so let us move on to the next presentation, which was by uh, Nandita, and she's going to talk about some tigers. Yeah, please go ahead, Nandita. Good morning, everyone. I'm Nandita Burman from India, representing NatureMeds, and we'll be presenting our work, Understanding the Importance of Social Media as a Citizen Science Platform by using tiger sighting photographs from Facebook. So firstly, citizen science is an useful method for collecting ecological data at large scales by involving various non-professional volunteers. And it is also an unique tool that can be used as a vehicle for direct experience of nature, as well as offering informal education. A variety of professions use social media platforms regularly, like Facebook, Instagram, Flickr, etc. For our study, we have selected Facebook as a citizen science platform because Facebook is one of the most actively used platforms across the globe. They have more, more than 2 billion active users monthly. People from various age groups can share their photos, videos, comments with conservation aspect, literature aspect, marketing aspects, and many more. That's why we just tried to gather as much records we uh, as much records from Facebook to understand the potential of those records uh, with respect to the ecological parameter. We choose tiger as our study animal because tiger is an umbrella species in conservation management. Uh, they help us to uh, know the uh, ecological condition of a uh, habitat where they are living uh, as they are the majestic carnivore of Indian subcontinent that uh, that's why they also help us to know the status of other animals uh, but uh, in a particular habitat uh, and uh, they are also a charismatic figure for interpreting tourism they get severe attention for most of the tourists Methods we have followed during our study, uh, we collected records, we collected as much records from Facebook of, uh, from the group uh, based on tiger from various uh, landscapes, such as uh, groups of Bandhavgar, groups of Sundarbans, groups of Tadoba, and many more. Then we extracted as much information, uh, maximum level of information we are getting from each post. Then we geotagged each record based on the location. And then uh, we curated all the records in a spreadsheet, then converted it in uh, accordance with Darwin Core standards. So uh, this is our. Uh, First case study, that's why we just tried to keep uh, our objective simple, uh, but impactful uh, to understand uh, certain aspects of tiger ecology and tiger centric tourism. Uh, for this, we created a special temporal uh, distributions map of the Bengal tiger, uh, finding its status and abundance in different landscapes, an idea of documentation rate from different tiger habitats. Results we obtained from our study. We have collected uh, 2,306 occurrence records from the uh, Facebook. And uh, 
this is the graph which is uh, showing the this is the map which is showing this occur all of the occurrence records and uh, most of the tigers in india are in the central indian landscape which is similar with the finding through camera traps which is laid by wii scientist team and we have collected data mostly from recent times and this is the graph representing that time period and this is the distribution map of occurrence records uh, based on year and month so in this slide there are two to three facts which comes out through this graph the visibility of tiger is significantly less during monsoon period uh, this is mainly for two reason that is the uh, tourism is uh, highly restricted during monsoon period and only few buffer zones remains open uh, all the forests become large green uh, and uh, with high undergrowth that significantly restrict uh, the uh, that significantly restrict the sightings and even in the post monsoon period when the parks also open up and the increase the sightings increasing sightings in december to april is in sync with the fact that this is the prime courtship period for uh, the tigers of india and hence they patrol a lot along their territory also as this is the dry season for indian forest the forest become more visible and open and this is the state wise distribution of tigers and uh, from facebook people uh, uh, people have documented 10 states but uh, but uh, whereas uh, in wii uh, scientist has documented 20 states that means many state is yet to be explored by the tourist and there is enormous scope of expansion of tiger tourism and this is the landscape wise distributions of tiger in india uh according to wii categories there are five broad landscapes which are uh, central india landscape shibalik hill and gangetic plain landscape northeast landscape sundarbans western ghat landscapes so in our study uh, the, from the occurrence records we got five uh, we have covered the five landscapes as shown in the map the central india landscape houses the majority of tigers of india so the result of our study makes us more curious and thoughtful uh, that we are planning to look into many other aspects which will help us to know the story of uh, indian tiger in a much detailed and interesting manner so this is our data set based on our study based on our uh, based on our this study uh, and we have recently published this data set in gbif so for our study i would like to thank nivedita uttam and arunoday and also the whole team of nature mates for assisting in data curation and manuscript preparations and i would like to acknowledge facebook and all the groups of documenting bengal tiger in that platform and uh, all the tiger images in these slides uh, which is mostly uh, photographed by our teammates so this is all about my presentation and in this uh, photograph uh, the pink girl uh, which is <laughs> me uh witnessing my first and uh, only tiger sighting in the wild at tadoba andheri tiger reserve uh, and the tiger uh, the popular name of the tiger is matkasu so this is all about my all about our study thank you so much thank you nandita uh, so are there any questions in the room oh we have one question hang on one second hmm? we're doing a we're doing a trade off uh hi there this is sulen from naturalis uh i think this is a really interesting project 
I'm just curious, uh, how complete are the data from Facebook when you compare it to other citizen science programs, sorry, platforms like iNaturalis, iNaturalist? Uh, is there any significant differences? Yeah, thanks. Nandita? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, please. You want to answer this? Yeah, can I? Can I? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, so I'm Arjun. I'm also co author of this uh, study. So the uh, data that we got from Facebook is quite complete. If you go through the uh, comments and every other uh, aspects of it, uh, you know, so what we have done is we selected the most important and the minimum common thing that we are getting from the data that we have, you know, intervened initially before we start our study. So most of the columns that we have kept in our uh, study were actually present in the post, like the location, like the uh, date, like the, you know, in case the tiger is known, the name of the tiger even. So yes, the way we have designed the study, the details are well kept in Facebook as well. And from the comments also, we have given enough, uh, we have given enough emphasis on the comment section. And then afterwards, we did some uh, literature review and we did try to find more data available on that particular, of that particular area or on that particular tiger as well. So uh, just to add a little bit, because I'm also one of the authors of this uh, uh, paper. Uh, if you uh, compare what was available on GBIF before this project was published, we had about 900 records and we have added about 2,300 records through this project. And GBIF records includes all the records from iNaturalist and uh, iNaturalist, almost every tiger record is a research grade and is passed on to GBIF because I, uh, I mean, identifying tiger is not a <laughs> not a big problem. So almost every record that is uh, posted becomes uh, uh, research grade quickly. So this is to answer kind of how much uh, how much difference is there with what is already what was avail already available and what was added by this project. Uh, Prabhakar, you want to ask a question? Yeah, so the, the question is, um, did you come across uh, issues in accessing Facebook data? Are there uh, issues of licenses? How did you handle all of that? Uh, also, you are putting out the locations. Were there issues of putting out precise locations? Were there? Um, the second thing is, did you identify individuals? Uh, Arjun did say that you identified individual tigers because many of these individual tigers are named and they can be identified with stripes and things like that. Uh, Nandita, Arjun. Uh, so uh, for the uh, thing, what we did is, uh, you know, the, we have added a column called coordinate uncertainty, where if a tiger is said to be in Tadoba, we put a radius across the location and that uh, that definitely says that the, uh, that tiger is within the range of this uncertainty because it is known from that place. That's how we have put the location data and also we have put the coordinate uncertainty part. For the licensing part, we are yet to be very sure about how to handle that. We have kept all the records, we have kept all the screenshots and every data so that we are looking to, you know, looking for a model where we can actually share these, uh, you know, uh, when we can more constructively use Facebook as a, uh, you know, input a social media platform for these type of studies. And uh, what is the third point you have raised? Yeah, no, essentially those two. Um... I was wondering and, and if uh, the, individual, identification. Name, ha, individual identification, individual like, identification, like you know the matka shoot and other. So these tigers are so well known that they are you know they are having their key number as well as the common name available in the net. But in other cases as well, we have got 
uh, we have you know research based on the available literature and we try to find the key number that is provided by the wii team while doing the you know the camera trap studies so uh, that part we are the way you know we have kept it is the amount of data we are sure about we put those in the data sheet but if there is any confusion we have not done that we have done similar things for you know sexual identity we know some these are males we know some are females but in certain cases where we are not sure about from the picture we kept it unsexed so that's how we did the whole data set till now and we are still working on it and uh, hi it's rishin here i'm also one of the co-author to this one more thing provoker i would like to add that uh, mostly we took the tiger reserve location as a overall location not exactly the drag detail points of the tiger being spotted unless it is being mentioned in the photograph and the other thing which we did is uh, for the identification uh, like we used our knowledge to identify the tigers with like the way it is done normally with the stripe patterns and things at the same time uh, for the data accessibility license thing mostly the data which is used here now mostly is actually from the pages of the like uh, tigers of kanha tigers of tadoba tigers of ranthambore so it's a group pages data which had the maximum number so it was not taken from the individual person posting it unless otherwise we re required some additional information from the person we directly asked them about those information and then incorporated the information in our data thank okay, you i think let's move on to the next presentation and then we'll have some time for discussion so thank you thank you everybody let's play uh, swati's presentation which is about the squirrels Hello everyone. I'm Swati and I'm a PhD student working in Sirid Lab at Isa Tirupati in India. In this talk, I'm going to give a brief about Squirrels of India database, which we have been building in our lab over the last two years, where we collected squirrel records from various sources like literature, museum data, citizen science portals, and social media websites. Squirrels are rodents which belong to the family Sirid and can be broadly classified into three groups based on the lifestyle. Tree squirrels and flying squirrels, both are arboreal and ground squirrels are terrestrial. The tree and ground squirrels are diurnal, whereas the flying squirrels are nocturnal. So in this database, we have collected occurrence records for about 30 species of squirrels, which are found in India, and the geographic range extends further into the neighboring countries. In India, the tree and flying squirrels are found in Western Ghats, the Deccan region, the central and northeastern part of the country, and the ground squirrels are high elevation species, which are restricted to certain regions in the Himalayas. And some of these species range further extends into the countries in Southeast Asia as well as Central Asia. Now, before we move further, why do we even need to study squirrels? As seen in this graph, mammals are one of the most understudied taxa when compared to others, which is quite alarming given their high diversity. Squirrels are a diverse group and they play an important ecological roles, including seed dispersals, pollination, and they are a prey base for lots of predator. They respond strongly to environmental changes around them, and this makes them an ideal study system to understand species response to anthropogenic changes. As these species have not been very well documented in traditional data, uh, this secondary sources of data can be used to fill these knowledge gaps. In South Asia, the species richness of the tree and flying squirrels is exceptionally high, though there are very less studies done on them. So now to overcome this lack of data to understand species occurrence patterns, opportunistic data collected by citizen scientists and photographers and nature enthusiasts who put their images on social media, they have a huge potential which can be used to fill knowledge gaps when it comes to species occurrence. In our lab, we collected the data for about 30 species of squirrels 
using primary and secondary sources. We collected about 29,692 records so far, and 42% of these records consist of social media sources, and 37% of the occurrence records come from traditional data, and 21% comes from citizen science portals. Now, we examine the temporal trends and spatial bias, and the bias caused due to the species characteristics, which might have an impact on the number of records which we have collected. Now, before I would like, before that, I would like to give a brief about the data collection workflow for the three sources. Here in traditional science data, we collected date occurrence data from literature, museum sources, and we also had internally collected lab data during the field work. And all of these three sources were collated and curated and which were stored in our database. For citizen science records, we manually searched in each of the portals and downloaded the occurrence data in a CSV format. And in some cases, we used R to download the, soft, uh, the occurrence records in bulk. And for sources like iNaturalist, we filtered the data from the GBIF repository. And again, all of these were curated and added to the database. For social media, the process were a little more tedious, where a team of student interns manually searched for each of these records on websites and chose the relevant images. We also noted other vital information and manually curated each record for species ID and later extracted the coordinates using geocode by awesome table and uh, post the curation of location, these uh, records were added to the database. We combined all these so three sources curated data to build the database and post curation, a large chunk of the data set had to be discarded and I'll be elaborating further about this. Now, majority of the records which were collected were that of tree squirrels, followed by ground and flying squirrels and the source wise breakdown is given in the graph. We collected data from about 14 different social media platforms and five different so citizen science portals, which include a internally curated WhatsApp group, which includes uh, different members from our institute who send us squirrel records from areas wherever they travel. Now for social media records, we had to manually check for species ID. About 68% of the total records had species ID mentioned, but only 58% of them were correct. Rest all were incorrect. For all these records, we had to manually check each of these and assign the correct species ID. Uh, when it comes to location, only 56% of the traditional records had a proper location mention and 61% of the social media records had a location name mentioned. The location data was much better in citizen science portals where only about 1% of the records did not have the location details. For social media records, 99% of them had a country data, but broad area and specific location were missing for about 33% and 77% uh, of the records. For the location-based analysis, we had to remove some of these records due to the high uncertainty in the coordinates assigned. So most of the traditional and citizen science records had the year and date information, but only about 26% of the social media records had the date of observation mentioned. We have used the date of posting as a proxy in these cases where the observation dates were not mentioned as this may lead to a loss of too much valuable data. Before curation, we had about 29,692 records and after curation, we retained only about 19,796 records. We almost lost close to 10,000 records in the process of curation. All these records with the curated locations were then plotted on a map as shown uh, this is for the traditional data, this is for citizen science, and this is for the social media. Now, as shown in these maps, we can see that the social media records are more in number as, of, as compared to traditional and citizen science data. We looked at the temporal trends in the number of occurrence records across these sources, and as expected, the traditional data decreased over time, and there's a boom in citizen science and social media records post-2010, which is in sync with the digital revolution uh, of smartphones, digital cameras, and use of social media and citizen science in the Asian region. Around uh, 2017 onwards, there's an increase in traditional data, which is basically mostly the data collected by our lab members. Now we plotted the locations across all these through sources in as heat maps, and we can clearly see that there's a spatial clustering in certain regions across all these three sources. To investigate this further, we wanted to see whether there exists any spatial bias in the number of records across these sources. And to understand this, we extracted the nightlight values, the human population density values, as well as the distance from road for each of these occurrence records. 
Now, uh, there was a significant difference across these three sources when it came to how far they are from the road. The social media and the citizen science records were more closer to the road as compared to the traditional data as seen in the graph. Uh, there's a significant difference across these three sources in the nightlight values of the occurrence records. Overall, social media and citizen science records are, have been collected from areas with higher nightlight values as compared to traditional data, which is, and most of these records have come from area which are more or less developed and hence have likely access to better technology and gadgets, which can enable the users to record more species. Now, there's a significant difference across the sources uh, based on where the records come from with respect to human population density. Overall, social media and citizen science records are, have been collected in areas with higher human population density as compared to traditional data. The traditional data are more or less spread across the gradient of human presence. Now, we also wanted to look at the species characteristics, whether if they contributed to the bias which we see. So based on the GLM analysis, we can clearly see that the nocturnal species are less likely to be recorded and the species which have a smaller range size are less likely to be recorded. And if a species is a tree squirrel, it is more likely to be recorded as compared to ground and flying squirrels. To summarize the majority of the records, which we see are of tree squirrels, tree squirrels followed by ground and flying squirrels. And there's a shift in the species occurrence data over the years and there is a sharp increase in the citizen science and social media records. More records are closer to the road and the species characteristics like activity, period, lifestyle and geographic range size seem to have an impact on the number of occurrence records. Now, uh, social media and citizen science records are a good add on to the traditional records and data which we have been collecting over years and this can actually aid in filling the knowledge gaps when it comes to species occurrences. Now though these data are large in number they require curation as these are opportunistic in nature hence have bias in them and in order to use them for scientific research purposes a proper curation has to be done. Now species characteristics do have an impact hence it's important to keep these bias in mind before using them. I would also like to thank the student interns who helped us collect this data and my lab members. Uh, to know more regarding our work, please scan the QR code given in this slide. And if you have any questions, please reach out to me on my email IDs. I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you. That was a really great presentation, Swati. Thank you. Uh, first, let us go to the, if there are any questions in the room, let's address them. In the meantime, I'll try to check if there are any questions in the chat. No questions in the room? No, no questions, Vijay. Okay. Uh, I don't see any questions on Slack or Zoom either. I think it was a lot of information. People are still processing it. So, okay. Hi, Vijay. Uh, Joe Miller here, GBF. I'm wondering um, how scalable are the social media analyses? Um, very interesting. I'm, I'm curious how easy it would to scale it to the global level uh, along Facebook and WhatsApp and all these different platforms. Any ideas? Mm. I mean, whatever experience I have so far, uh, especially Facebook, the, the APIs are becoming more and more restrictive after certain incidences, certain political incidences, I should say, in recent years. So it is it has been really, really difficult to get data out of it. So uh, as far as the Tiger data, we actually did it manually. So Nandita spent endless hours browsing each Facebook group and actually typing in the metadata. But there are a few tools available which, which can harvest at times, not really legally, but <laughs> like uh, some kind of uh, scraping, which is not supposed to be uh, allowed in some sense. But then they definitely um, 
it is a, a lot of laborious and time consuming task to get this data out. Uh, Nandita Arswati, you want to add? Swati, we are not able to hear you. Am I audible now? Hello? Yes, yes. So now we can hear you. Yeah. So what I was saying is a lot of this, we had to do it manually, even for multiple other websites. So API scrapping and all sometimes might be problematic, especially when it comes to us wanting to publish it. So we had a team of undergrad interns who helped us do this. And also the other thing is in many other websites, you might not get the information which is visibly there in the text, which might not be able to be easily extracted when we do the API scrapping. So it was little too tedious for us to figure other way out. So we just had to do it manually at this point. But yeah, with some tools and some ease of access, I think it should be easier. But given that these are all real people who use certain uh, accounts for other purposes, I think it's not going to be easy. I have a, another follow-up. Follow Do you envision would it be possible to use camera trap technology to just scan the whole internet for images and the metadata on them and make observations out of them? Is there a way of merging these two worlds together in some utopian, dystopian way? That's that is a really interesting thought. I've never thought about it, but yes. I mean, in, in some sense, some of these, some um, of these uh, <laughs> uh, internet scrapers do the same. I mean, they don't actually use camera, but they actually load all the content and try to harvest information from it. Uh, Nandini, you want to add something? I just want to say that if there could be a way for us to figure out how to do this, either with labor or uh, through tools like code-based tools, um, I think there's a whole world of information on social media that just doesn't come to citizen science portals, uh, at least for some groups like squirrels. Um, so we found uh, so many novel records um, on social media. People have no idea what they're seeing or what they're posting. And if there's a way for us to harvest this, um, I think we would be the richer for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing we have been trying doing in, in most of the Indian biodiversity forums is kind of slowly guide all these people on social media to start using uh, India Biodiversity Portal and iNaturalist. But uh, it, it takes a lot of efforts for anyone to really convince, start doing it for all their photographs. So, I think it's mostly to do with the engagement. I think the engagement level is higher in social media. Like if someone posts a photo, they're likely to get more likes and some sort of uh, response, which is little lacking. And I think they might not have a good understanding of the importance of these records being uh, saved in a proper repository. Maybe a little bit of outreach and understanding of how the records are vital might be useful. Any other questions? I don't see any yet on Zoom. Uh, Vijay, I just wanted to add our experience with uh, the Spider India um, uh, Facebook group. Um, so getting data from Facebook has been, uh, there are APIs that are exposed, but has been challenging because uh, once you find that people are, uh, you know, a, a bot or, uh, uh, you know, some API has been uh, uh, successfully used from an IP, they block it. So you'll have to wait and get it down. Uh, even if after you get the records, there needs to be some kind of manual check and curation. So on the Spider India group, we've uh, taken down the data from... Uh, from Facebook, uh, uh, thousands and thousands of records, and uh, are trying to do uh, uh, and have built an interface where humans are manually, they can be curated and put together. With things like uh, WhatsApp and things like that, it's completely encrypted. So communications within groups are completely closed. I think Nandini had done some WhatsApp 
collection of data, but they were within the group and they're completely encrypted, so they cannot be accessible to the outside world at all. Yes, Swati described that. We have an on-campus uh, closed group with a couple of hundred people on the group. But uh, we've told them that we are taking this data and we want to make it public and most users are okay with it. But of course, we might have to do something when we actually do this. We might get some waivers or something. I don't know. Uh, we haven't really gone that far with thinking yeah, about it. Yeah, I think most of these are just students who are just eager to, like they are part of most uh, this birding club which we have at ISA. And some others are also some other students who stay in different parts of the country. And they just, uh, we had made a request uh, to multiple student groups asking them to join and at least send some records of uh, squirrel calls or any photos with a proper location because WhatsApp helps in sending exact geolocation, which unlikely, uh, which doesn't really happen in a social media site. So that is one of the reasons why we have in, uh, included the WhatsApp source in the citizen science one and not in a social media one, given the accuracy with which we get the location and data. So yeah, I think we have not publicly used any of the photos and uh, recordings yet, but yeah, I think like Nandini said, there has to be some way we get their permission and we we'll obviously with credits, a lot of this is something which we might be using at some point. Uh, Prabhakar and Balu, do you have, any, I, I don't see any questions or do you, are there any other questions in the room? before we move on to the more broader discussion. There was just one uh, comment that Balu had put. Other questions. Yeah. Yeah. There was Go just ahead. one okay. comment that Balu had put uh, saying, uh, is EXIF data available on social media posts, uh, you know, which, is, which has location and things like that in the photographs? Are they available? Are they scraped and given out? What is the status when you download such photographs from social media groups uh, no i think purposely, they're not available facebook removes it purposely so that more identification information or more details of the person posting cannot be found so it is done on purpose uh, that's the case with most with the exception i think of um, flickr which maintains it flickr also lets you geo tag your uh, photographs so that is there but now uh, because Flickr does not have a very strong organizational backing, which earlier was Yahoo, it is the use I have seen is is declining quite a bit. So, Prabhaka, do you have any broader comments about the whole biodiversity informatics scenario in Asia? and in global south yeah I, actually i had a specific question for the specify uh, person who who gave a gave a presentation from the media if the person is there uh, uh, yeah william one of the points that you kind of mentioned was uh, uh, internet in these places are very very poor mm -hmm. uh, how do you kind of uh, overcome that? I mean, do you have uh, do you have a web-based specify installation somewhere where all the collections, uh, you know, contribute data to the, uh, you know, locally and then put it up? Or how do you how do you challenge how do you access that? Because specify seven is completely uh, web-based. William, are you there? Yes, thank you. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah. I, I believe that uh, it is possible to use Specify 7 in a sort of offline, offline in inverted commas mode. So you, you needn't expose it on the web and use it in the, in the typical web application scenario. It can be installed locally and used within an organization. This is my understanding. Um, but as far as the, the question about the general availability of internet infrastructure and, and uh, web access. Yes, th this is a problem that uh, the National Museum of Namibia specifically struggles with. Um, it's, I don't think it's really a widespread Namibian problem. I think it's more of an organizational problem. And uh, we do expect this to, to be alleviated soon. Thank you. 
Okay, so I have some kind of views or updates about what has been happening in Asia in general about biodiversity informatics. I think one of the very nice things that has happened thanks to GBIF is the uh, is the team of uh, uh, GBIF um, Asia support team that was formed and um, that has been pretty active helping a lot of organizations within Asia uh, publishing data. Uh, looking at just the Indian scenario, I think there were at least seven or eight new uh, publishers registered in last four or five months and three of them have already published data sets. There are remaining are all kind of uh, getting ready to publish their first data set. So that is a really good development. And as part of that also, there has been this uh, GBF Asia office hour where a lot of um, biodiversity informatics folks are showing up for some time to just chat about what is happening or how they can mobilize data, how they can use data. A uh, lot, of, lot of queries of that kind and very interesting discussions. And not only discussions, but connections being made within the within the people who are attending the meeting saying, oh, I know how to do this. And then someone is asking, oh, I was just looking for someone how to do this. Can we just connect off, offline and start working on that particular project? So there are a lot of these kind of connections and community building happening. Uh, recently, there was also a GB data mobilization course with 30 participants across Asia and one of the very uh, nice interesting thing that was tried out was there was a um, a small prize announced for all those who could immediately like like publish a data set within a week's time and we were surprised that just like all from the people who attended attended this training seven data sets published just within a week which uh, Laura Russell says she has never seen in any other um, uh, training. So Asian community is definitely kind of um, gearing up and coming together to do, um, uh, to do some work together. And uh, one more thing we are trying out currently is again a data mobilization course, which is at self-paced with really minimal uh, inputs from the trainer so it's going to be like again uh, we'll assign the chapters and then they will read through they will uh, come back with questions at the office hours and we'll have only one session where we do the card playing game for the gb data mobilization so that is what we are trying it just started this week and today was uh, in fact the first session of that uh, section so these are some of the things that are happening with gb and also I'm seeing a lot of uh, biodiversity informatics community getting uh, together across. There is more usage of the citizen science portals like um, India Biodiversity Portal, INHL is, is be increasingly being used. There are few other portals which are, um, uh, which are also kind of uh, picking up uh, in, in Asia. So I think these are some of the positive things. Hopefully we'll get to see uh, more information available, but there are certainly more inputs required from the global, global community in terms of capacity building, in terms of more funding opportunities maybe. And I'm pretty sure Balu and Prabhakar both have uh, more things to add. So I'll pass on to uh, Balu, you want to go next? Yeah, hey. So uh, I basically wanted to flag just one aspect of this um, biodiversity informatics practice in the global south, which is normally when we talk about um, scale, we always you know, look you know, at the global scale, right? I mean, like from where all data can be mobilized to a larger global, larger infrastructure, global scale. So, but particularly in the context of global south, you know, countries like India or in many countries in Africa, I think the challenge is more to have a downscale infrastructure 
a, a scale, an appropriate scale at which biodiversity data can be used by the local communities or by the local academic institutions to assess biodiversity in that specific landscape or a particular region. I think this is becoming more an urgent need with the kind of developmental priorities that these countries face. So I think this is time for us to you know, engage in creative ways of designing technological systems, designing infrastructure, thinking about access and, of, and capacities within the socio-political context of these countries. Uh, not too much, but, uh, you know, uh, all that I wanted to say is, uh, and, uh, you know, in Jeeva's vision document, Asia was considered, a, is considered a thrust area, and there is going to be a lot of activity in Asia, except for that fantastic case study of Taiwan, which seems to have a comprehensive, and you can look at Taiwan's uh, first slide that she put up, Daphne put up, she said there were different elements that were necessary. And one of it was infrastructure, technology, uh, uh, you know, and they have a developer team, they have, uh, you know, uh, they have support and it seems to be an overall ecosystem. Uh, I would think that such overall ecosystems, which spans technology, technology development, uh, mobilization, researchers, talking to the researchers, community participation, citizen engagement, campaigns for citizen engagement. These must be an ecosystem of biodiversity informatics that must form in Asia for it to flourish. Taiwan seems to have done it in a, in a, in a, in a nice energized way. Just mo data mobilization programs that often are funded and executed in Asia and other countries I think is not the, uh, you know, is not sustainable, is not the right way to go about it. This is, uh, you know, data mobilization saying, we'll mobilize the data and put it into uh, international platforms and GBIF, I think have limitations. And unless you build a certain ecosystem of biodiversity informatics, of standards, of the data needs of local communities, of the conservation needs of local communities, it's very, very difficult to get things going in Asia. So I would think it is important for the global community to realize, I mean, look around the current workshop. Uh, what is the representation from places in the South? Are they participating in building standards? Are they participating in building infrastructures? Are they participating in networking institutions? These are large potentials that somehow have not been addressed, I would say, by the global biodiversity informatics communities. I think uh, there are uh, people from the global biodiversity informatics community present in the uh, audience. If uh, you know, if some of them can express their opinions, it will be very, very useful. Nandini has a, has a question as well. Um, I have a comment, not directly in response to what you were saying. So if someone wants to respond to you, I can wait. Yes, I can see not? Joe. Up again. Here we go. Yes. <laughs> well, maybe this is a good time to talk about the the event we have in late third, late uh, November, in Bangkok, uh, which is uh, basically it's a combination of things: this outreach event uh, for GBF in, East, in Southeast Asia, in Asia in general. It's also a regional nodes meeting. Uh, for the Asian regional nodes. And it's also kind of a high level outreach to government officials across the region as well, trying to both uh, get the top down and bottom up approach to get interactions within Asia. Uh, as you rightly said, you know, we, we have lacked informal participation in Asia, uh, but as you see from this talk, there's, there's lots of great uh, data mobilization in Asia uh, and uh, well, Africa as well. And the participation in Africa has grown uh, much uh, with the, the success of the bid program. And we're seeing some of that now in with the success of BIFA in Asia. But of course, BIFA is a much smaller project uh, funding than, than bid is. So uh, we have a strategy and we'll continue to speak with all of you and, and listen to you. And yes, and, and Laura just put in the chat the, uh, the link to the summit, which I... Um, What's going to do afterwards. So thank you, Laura. So let's continue the conversation. I know we've got a lot of work to do, but it is 
uh, an emphasis for us. Thank you. Nandini, you want to go next? And I guess. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, VJ. I was just going to say shameless plug. Um, Tadwig is going to be in Tasmania next year. So hopefully we can have more Asia and the governing board as well. And the year after is in, um, we hope, in Okinawa. So um, I really hope to see a lot more um, uh, participants from the Asia Oceania region uh, coming to Tadwig and being involved. I'll just put a plug in for the regional support team in Asia as well, in particular, and also in Africa. Uh, they've been very proactive. VJ is part of that team of, of developing workshops and having these uh, office hours, I think you call them, which is fantastic. It's really having people on the ground, making those on the ground connections has been working very well. And there are only four of you. You know, we, you know, in the perfect system, we'd have four people in every country and every country would be a node, but this is kind of a, a stepping stone in that way and really leading the way in how uh, we can do this better with more local people on the ground. Uh, of course, in Asia, speaking those languages, um, having two uh, traditional Chinese speakers in the team is, is fantastic, but we do need other languages, of course, across Southeast Asia as well. Uh, but it's a great start. And we're using this as an example in our fundraising to try to get um, more funds to, to strengthen and, and grow those um, that look regional capacities, especially in Asia and Latin America and Africa and East Central Asia. It's everywhere. Thank you. Um, we just have one more uh, comment from Arthur. So is that okay, Vijay? Yeah, sure, please. I'm Arthur Chapman. I'm from Australia, private consultant. Um, there's a lot of work going on at a high level, political level around Asia, Australia, South Pacific, et cetera, at the moment, where there are free trade negotiations being carried out. There's one between Australia and India. And it'd be really nice to get biodiversity brought into some of those high level discussions as part of trade uh, negotiations. And I think it's up to us all to talk to our individual governments so, so that topics like biodiversity and biodiversity information and data is brought into those negotiations. Yep. Yeah, uh, everyone's probably heard of the G20 group of 20 countries. This year it's being hosted uh, in Indonesia and they have a meeting in November, uh, but next year's host, the G20 is hosted by India. So I think this is a fantastic opportunity uh, for India and the to work with other partners in the G20, including uh, GBIF participant countries to try to get uh, biodiversity informatics, uh, data mobilization and biodiversity on the government level at the G20. So we got a whole year to work towards that. And that's uh, just been on the top of my mind for a while. Uh, we have this outreach event in November. Uh, I don't think we're gonna be able to get any side events going uh, for the G20 because we're really focusing on the COP 15 in Montreal, and, and we're focusing on that as our policy initiative. But for the next year, the G20 in India, let's, let's keep talking about that. I think that's a great opportunity for all of us. Okay, I think it's back to you, BJ. Yeah, Nandini, you want to go next? Nandini had a question. Yeah, I just had a couple of comments. Um, I, I think that while while we're it's great that we're talking about data and how we can collect data, um, biodiversity data, taxa focused data. I wonder if ecosystems like India are mature enough uh, to actually use this wisely or deal with this uh, phenomenon. Even I mean maybe it's outside the purview of this conference, but uh, two things come to mind. One is um, the active uh, resistance against citizen science data from people who give scientists permission to do work. Um, and this is a this comes and goes uh, across states, but it can be pretty severe. They uh, don't understand the value um, or or that this is not real, you know, scientific research uh, that you need permissions for. Uh, and the second is the use of the the citizen science kind of data for policy. Uh, in the recent uh, months, in the last few months in India, we've had a massive overhauling of the Wildlife Protection Act, which is the government act that determines uh, protection status for all wildlife in India and therefore dictates scientific research as well as hunting. 
um, a lot of the data that has been used to reassess animals has been citizen science data. And there's a furious war within the scientific community about whether citizen science data is equal to rigorous field collected data and whether you can assess uh, risk status of species using data like this. So I wonder if our communities, whether they are managers or policymakers or scientists even, are mature enough to uh, handle these large quantities of data and truly you know, understand what this means. Uh, and might be nice uh, maybe um, at the sessions that are coming to India in the next few years, uh, if some of these were addressed too. I think there are some really great points and I think we should follow up on this, like the conversations as well as maybe next year Stadwig have more focus and uh, maybe discuss more on, on these lines. They are very crucial points. Valu, you want hey. to say something? No, just, just a very short comment, you know, adding to Nandini's thing. When this also exactly brings out the contradiction between a state perspective, a state-based data mobilization or a, or a driving biodiversity informatics practice from the state's perspective and from the civil societies or the citizens' perspective. Now, this is something that we have to bear in mind. I mean, we can do parallel events, side events to G20s and you no know, co-ops and other stuff, but what's happening, what's happening on the ground is completely you know, uh, different to what the state might say or act. Uh, Shelly, do we have any comments from the room again? Anything else from the room? Not so far. Okay. It's a quiet, it's a quiet crowd. <laughs> yes, there's lot, lots to think and process. Any anyone else has a comments or any questions that has cropped up after all these discussions or even any lingering questions about the presentations? We still have like three minutes. I think everyone's hungry for lunch. Yes, you know, or I, tea or something I, else. I, yes, I think so. So, uh, if 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 the if the authors or any other people they want to continue the conversation, we can jump into one of the breakout rooms and let the physical uh, in person attendees go and enjoy their lunch. Maybe I can be here for some more time to talk about. I, I definitely have a couple of questions for Swati and Nandita. Yeah, sure. So Shelly, if you can create breakout rooms and then I would like to thank all the authors and Prabhakar and Balu for supporting in this thing and the whole Tadwick community in general because it has been a really good uh, learning in some so sense to kind of learn from the global community what's happening, what can be done in this respect, and I hope in with with two back to back conferences coming in our region, Tasmania and Okinawa, maybe we gather our community more in person, connect more, and kind of build build much more on it. Thank you all. Prabhakar Balu, if you want any closing comments, please go ahead. Nothing, just thanks. Okay. Thank all the participants. Thank you very much. Okay, so for everyone that's here, lunch, as a reminder, is not in the restaurant.